Well, good afternoon. Somewhere is my wife. Where? Oh, there she is. Reverend uh, Betsy Singleton Snyder joined us today, which means there's four little boys at home that are going crazy, wondering where their mama is. But uh, th Skip, thank you for this opportunity to be here today. I think this is a, a, a great venue on an absolutely crucial topic about what needs to be done, uh, what do we think about the proposals with regard to health care in the United States and how it's delivered and how the system works for Americans. And what I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about what I think the problem is that we're trying to solve, and there are multiple problems. Um, in fact, Skip, I think I may go over here and use this podium if that's okay. Is this one still on? Yeah. In order to evaluate any solution, if we all have different views of what the problem is, you know, we're not going to buy into anybody else's solution because we're going to say, no, wait, this is what the problem is. I have a leaky roof. I need to replace the roof. Somebody else thinks, no, that's bad foundation. We need to replace the foundation. Well, let me go through what, how I see the problem, and then we'll get to your, your comments and questions. First of all, I, I, I think there's three different groups that we need to be concerned about. And the one that most people, I think, agree on, although with varying levels of intensity, is that we have a problem with too many people in the United States that don't have health insurance. And that estimate is somewhere now around 47 to 50 million, probably in the 47 million range, that don't have health insurance. Some of them are illegal immigrants. Some of them are people who are never going to be, you know, they've probably got four different ID cards with five different aliases. They're never going to be in the system. I mean, we, we, we just have a, there's kind of those kinds of people. The great majority are American citizens, a lot of them working, who just aren't working for somebody that provides health insurance. So you got that group. We also have a group, though, of people who are bare for part of the time. And the most recent estimate I found is for calendar years 2007, 2008, there were about 87 million or so Americans who were bare for at least part of the time, didn't have any health insurance for part of that period. Now, 87 million American citizens, that's a lot of Americans, and those are primarily people, you know, in the 18 to 64 category. That's a lot of people who don't have any health insurance. Life does not call a timeout during those two or three months that you're between jobs, three or four months after you graduate before you find a job. So that, that's that category of folks who don't have in, uh, insurance. Um, in Arkansas, for 2007, the estimate is that there were about uh, 260,000 Arkansans without health insurance who were working. Over a quarter of a million Arkansans who were working who did not health, have health insurance. Now the reason I focused on that point is I was talking to a woman the other day, or I guess she sent me a letter, and she said, I want to do something about those indigent people without health insurance, but we don't need to do what the president's proposing. Well, if you define the problem as an indigent one, you're going to have a different solution, but it's not. You know, a lot of these folks right here in Arkansas are working people who don't have health insurance. So that's, we can have, I'll respond to any of your thoughts or questions or hear your thoughts on, on that topic. The second group, the underinsured. And I know this includes some of you in here because I've already talked to you about it. Um, what do you mean by underinsured? It's people who have health insurance. They're in account in the number of Americans who have health insurance. But they would have policies that have big deductibles, big out-of-pocket expenses. Yeah, it helps you a lot when you run up the, you know, the $30,000 hospital bill for an accident or something. But you still end up with several thousand dollars personal debt that you owe to hospitals uh, and, and doctors. Or you have inadequate coverage. Best example of that I ran into uh, recently, and some of you heard me tell this story before, was a medical student here in Arkansas at UAMS. Wonderful, brilliant young woman, I think she's probably doing her residency now, has insulin-dependent diabetes. Her doctor wanted her to have an insulin pump to give her the best control so that she will, you know, live for decades and be serving us and operating on us for decades to come. The policy that she has through AMS, like most colleges in the United States, very poor policies, doesn't cover insulin pumps. Yes, she has health insurance. She's one of those numbers, yes, I have health insurance, but the policy is so skimpy, it doesn't meet the needs that she has. 
Um, the other issue you get into with, with underinsured is those who have a policy, but they're on the individual market, but the insurance company said, fill out this health form. And it turned out they had pre-existing conditions. They'd had a heart disease. They may have had a breast cancer. They may have had a lump in the breast. You know, whatever the insurance company wants to say, and they come back and say, yeah, we'll sign a contract with you. We will not cover heart disease. We will not cover breast-related issues, but we're glad to cover everything else. So they have exemptions in their policy that, in fact, don't cover the problems they're having. That's another example of the, the underinsured. The third group, I think, is the group that we're having the most problems convincing. And that's, I think, a lot of you here may be in this category today, either the convinced or the un unconvinced, but you're in this category. You're people who have insurance. You pretty much like what it is. You just assume not pay the premiums, but you're, you know, you're paying your bills, you're paying your premium, you like your coverage, you like your doctor. Things are going pretty well. And you want to keep what you have. The point I want to make to you today is for those of you who say, I don't want anything to change because I like what I have, it is changing. We have seen it change. We can go, we're, at the, well, we're not at the Clinton School, Skip. We're at the State House Convention Center, but we're at a Clinton School event. You remember when Bill Clinton worked on this in 93 and 94 and the plan didn't get adopted, never, nothing got out of the House uh, Committee? We have now had a 15-year experiment about what happens if you do nothing, and the problems are exacerbating. From 41 to 42 million uninsured, we're now in the 47 to 50 million people. We have more and more businesses that are bailing out on providing uh, coverage. But I want to go through three categories of those of us who have coverage and like what it does. Category number one is those who are in the individual market. Clinton School gets a donation from the soft drink industry, if I'll... <laughs> Skip said, I wish. Those in the individual market. Now, what does that mean? I was there for quite a while when I was practicing medicine in different emergency rooms in Camden and Searcy. I just went down to an insurance company, said, I want a policy. They sold me a policy. Individual market. Now, 16 to 17 million Americans, that's how they get their insurance. These are the folks that have absolutely no negotiating power with insurance companies. So rates can go up. They're the ones that have to deal with these pre-existing conditions. They may have a policy, but it exempts out certain things. Um, a risk that most people don't know about that has come out in Congress under subpoenaed testimony, or not subpoenaed, I guess, testimony under oath in the last few weeks is the whole problem with rescissions. And there's been some dramatic testimony, I mean, literally stories of, of, of people who had gone to the individual market, had their policy, were diagnosed with something catastrophic. The insurance company went back and reviewed the form they filled out to get the coverage and said, wait, there was a t test here several years ago that showed you had a gallstone. You didn't tell us about that test. We didn't know about that test. By the way, the patient didn't know about that test. The doctor knew about it, not the patient. Here's all the money you gave us in premiums. We're reimbursing all your money. It's as if we never had a contract. And the person says, yeah, but I had my surgery yesterday. I mean, for one woman, it was she had already had her mastectomy and was starting her chemotherapy when she got the premium money back and saying, you're not covered. That is the risk of the individual market, this whole concept of rescissions. The insurance companies say they're going to continue to do it. Um, about, about a half percent of the time they do do that. Now, if you were an insurance company and somebody was lying to you, you know, some of you would probably do the same. It's one of the issues that we need to grapple with, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. The second group, small business. I'm talking now about small businesses who have coverage for themselves and their employees. And for most of us in Arkansas, when we think about a small business, we're thinking 5, 10, 20, 30 employees. A per, uh, I talked to a man recently who's opposed to all the stuff that Obama has proposed, opposed the House bills, opposed the Senate bills. Very nice man. So you, I said, well, tell me about what your coverage is. And, he says, we pay about three-fourths of the premiums. We have less than 20 employees. I said, how's it going? He said, it's terrible. The rates keep going up. It's a big problem. He said, but I solved it this year. I said, what'd you do? I said, we have a family business. Several of my family members are in it. We took the three wives, moved them out of the group plan, put them in the individual market, and my premium went down. 
I said, well, you're now aware that you have three people who are prone or are at risk of all the problems of rescission in the individual market. He said, I know, but that's the only way I could keep my rates under control. The problem with small business is the rates are going up much more rap rapidly than for anyone else. It is small business that's feeling the most economic pressure. It is small business that does not have the negotiating uh, power with a small group. It is small business when they hire a new employee who has some health problem, they see their, their rates uh, go up. If you're a small business person, your competitor doesn't provide health insurance for your employees. It puts you at risk, and more and more businesses are doing that. In fact, we're seeing more and more Americans have their employer cancel all on the policy. Okay, the third group. We had individuals, we had small business, now the large employers, and federal employees. All, you know, my staff and I and all federal employees, we're part of the Federal Employees Health Plan. We have a menu. You know, we're treated the same. All federal employees can choose, we're treated the same. Here's the problem with large employers. Premiums continue to go up. The estimate is for family of four, the premium is going to go up $1,100 a year average for the next 10 years. Premiums are going up two to three times faster than wages are going up. You may not know it, you may not be aware of it when it happens, but co-pays can go up and deductibles can go up. It's like raising your premium, only they don't tell you it's raising your premium. You're just having to pay more money to get what you want. The other thing that you are having to do under the current system, you're paying for everyone else. You're paying for those folks who don't have insurance. Dr. Bates, when we did our forum at uh, Children's Hospital a couple weeks ago, of the, this is his words now, of the people who come to Children's Hospital and get that great care, and they will continue to get that great care, of the ones who don't have health insurance, the self pays, 97% pay nothing. Well, who pays the bills? All you who have health insurance pay it. That's what's part of that rise in premiums is. That's what's impacting, you know, that's one of the reasons you're seeing uh, your, your rates go up. We have another issue with our big insurance companies now. I mean, I'm sorry, our, our big plans. We're seeing more and more dollars that go into the insurance company. A higher percentage is staying with the insurance company and not going to health care. Uh, more going for administration than, is going to, than, than ought to go than, than was in the past, and that needs to be turned around. If you are a large business that has group health plan for your employees, and most do, you are also feeling the incredible economic pressure internationally. Uh, I think the UAW and the American auto manufacturers estimate that when you go down and look at a new American-made car, I don't know, $1,500, $1,400, 1500 of that sticker price is health care expenses for their employees, their employees' families, and their retirees. When a car comes in on a boat from overseas, it doesn't have that same uh, cost. Right away, our companies are at a disadvantage. It's one of the reasons you've seen people like Walmart and traveling around with the Service Employees International Union for the last three years or so, talking about why we need to do something for, about health care uh, reform in this country, because it's hurting our ability to compete internationally. Anyway, my point is, for those of us who have health insurance and are basically satisfied with what we have, and don't want it to change, the point I want to make to you today is it is changing. We have seen it change in the past, it's going to change in the future, and you're not going to like the changes that are coming. I, I want you to have that policy that you like. We all want to have access to the doctors we want. We don't want to interfere with that in any way, but the finances of it are changing in such a way that it puts all of us at risk of not having the kind of coverage we want in the future. I want to very briefly just touch on some of the things that have been said about the different proposals. Now, you know, we've got a lot of different proposals out there. Uh, the Senate's got some versions. The House has some versions. We read in the paper over the weekend, the version seems to be changing during the August recess, which I think is great as we have this, these robust uh, discussions. But just several things that I really want to touch on that I really put in the category, some of them of, of myths. Uh, the Congress is not going to pass a bill that kills off old people to save money. Uh, there's too many members of Congress that are old people. Uh, we have a lot of self-interest in this whole thing. Um, but that is, at, that is not what that provision is. The provision, you know, that you were talking about, I mean, that has been talked about is one that would just say Medicare could pay a doctor once every five years if the doctor wanted to and the patient wanted to, who's on Medicare, sit down and have a discussion about filling out what kind of treatment they would want if they were in some kind of, of terminal uh, uh, 
condition. That proposal, by the way, came from a conservative Republican senator, Johnny Isaacson from Georgia. He was in the House for a while, very nice man. He does not understand where all this uproar came about with what he thought was a very straightforward provision to help seniors get the kind of care they want. But anyway, the bottom line is, I can assure you that nobody in the Arkansas delegation, Republican or Democrat, is going to support a bill that knocks off old people to save money. That we're not going to support anything that rations care. We're not going to uh, support a bill that is not fiscally sound. And it is that is the big challenge. We haven't figured out how to pay for health care in the United States. We already know the, the private market premiums go up. In the defense budget, the most rapidly growing part of the budget that we don't know how to get under control is the health care costs for our people in the military, their families, and the re retirees. The veterans health care system, which we dearly love and want to support, we solve the problems the old-fashioned way, we add money to it. Uh, uh, Medicare we've, is unsustainable on the trajectory it's, it's on. We have got to figure out how to get health care costs under control. At the same time, we improve quality and preserve choice. And so those are the kinds of things we need to look at while we're talking about how do we pay for it. But I'm not going to support a bill that doesn't look like it's uh, going to be paid for. We, can't, we have got to get these deficits under control. Uh, I don't want, I've never been a big fan of this public option over the weekend. It looks like there's some people in the administration that think that it could, that it's not essential either. But if, if there is a public option, yeah, I think there's a variety of viewpoints on that. Uh, if, if there is some kind of a public plan option, absolutely no one should be mandated to be in it. No one should be mandated to be in any government-run uh, uh, option like that. That's just not, this needs to be about choices. And this is basically intended to be a market-based system where people can choose between all these different uh, insurers out there. And the, th the final thing I would say, and then I guess I move up there and let Skip take this microphone. This is about preserving choice and access to the doctor and health care that you want. And if we run into things that get in that way of that, then we need to change it. And if we see things in the bills and the proposals as this debate goes on over the next several weeks, then we need to change it. But I'll tell you right now. The biggest detriment we have right now to doctor choice and patients making those choices is we have so many people whose coverage doesn't work for them. And as time goes by, more and more of us are going to find us in that, uh, that category. That's all I'm going to say, Dean Rutherford, and let's uh, hear from some comments and questions, and I'll move over there. You know, you know Dr. Phil had more people than I did. So it would be all right with me if you all would turn on your little computers and Blackberries and Twitter and tweet all your folks and say we're trying to beat Dr. Phil's record. But... Well, let's give him a round of applause before we start the question. Now, obviously there's a lot of interest and a lot of hands and we're going to do our best to get to as many people as possible. Let me tell you the ground rules on the questions. There are people, Nikolai, uh, Eric is here in the back with a microphone. Where is Ashley? Ashley is right over here. So raise your hands. Ashley, Eric, Nikolai. When I recognize you, when I recognize you, please, they will come to you. Please step out in the aisle and ask your question. They have the microphone so that everybody can hear. Yes, sir, you've had your hand up. So wait for Nikolai to get there. And let me ask one other thing before we do it, so that more people can have uh, opportunities. Please try to make your comments and your questions short, long comments you can send to the congressman's office, but so we can get to a lot of people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has said this uh, proposed health care plan is going to cost $1 trillion. Uh, this couldn't come at a worse time when our federal budget is, is, is tripling, de our deficit is tripling from $700 billion to $2 trillion. So how are we going to pay for this when uh, China and Saudi Arabia say they're not going to buy our T-bills, as many T-bills anymore as they were in the past? So how are we going to pay for this? The only way to do it is either taxes, which Congress was scared to death to do and shouldn't do, or to print the, print the money out of thin air like they did in the past after the guns and butter thing of Johnson and uh, Clinton when they print, uh, had hyperinflation. You destroy the dollar. And, and then we have... All right, so, uh, okay, let's, let, let's go as we get... The question is how we're going to pay for it. I think, I, think, I think it's a great question. Skip, 
I may move around a little bit. I had a little trouble hearing everything he said. I don't know if it's just me standing here, but I think that is the number one question. Is we, could, we, may all, we may come up with a plan that we don't all agree with, but at some point we'll have a plan. The issue is, how do we pay for it? And that's what I was getting at with all these, these uh, talking about we haven't figured out how to do that. All I can tell you at this point is, in the broad theme, I know Mike Ross feels that way, and Marin Barry and our senators, we are committed to paying for the plan that we have. Here's, here's what we have right now. We have a total American, total American dollars every year in healthcare is about 2.6 trillion. 2.6 trillion. Now, if we can find somewhere in that 2.6 trillion dollars, somewhere around 100 billion dollars a year. So if the 2.6 trillion is here, the 100 billion is way down here. If we can find somewhere in that 2.6 trillion, 100 billion dollars a year, because that trillion here is over 10 years. It's about 100 billion a year. Um, we can dramatically improve our, uh, uh, the way our healthcare system works for Americans. But the other part of it is, if we, part of finding the savings is we've got to stop these prices and costs that keep going, and the costs that keep going up and up and up, we've got to start turning and level those things out. And so that's part of the whole issue too. But I agree with you. I think that is the biggest challenge we have, is how do we pay for it? And we are gonna find ways to do that, part I can give you some examples of some of the things that we do. Well, let me give you some examples. Uh, chronic disease management. We have an issue with folks who have chronic diseases. If for reasons they don't have good health insurance, they only end up coming into the hospital with crises, it's, it, that runs up the health care bill for everyone. It is much cheaper to have ongoing, sustained primary care that keeps people tuned up. We have an issue with readmissions to hospitals, and part of that is that same issue. Yeah, they get in the hospital, and we take care of them, they go home, if they don't have good health insurance or good access to care, they don't stay tuned up, and they get bumped back in the hospital. Readmissions runs up cost of, of, of care. The, the issue of lack of health insurance leads people to delay going to the doctor, going to the hospital, going to the emergency room, so they come in sicker. Or they don't go to a primary care doctor, they end up going to the emergency room and that runs up care. So there's things that we are trying to do and going to look at doing. Part of it involves increasing, by the way, the number of primary care. But, it's, but, it's, but there, it's, all part of, it's all part of the same issue. It's all, right. all part of the same issue. Uh, there's a lady right in front of you, Eric, right here that has her hand up right there. No, no, she's, she's behind you. Yeah, the lady behind you. First, I want to say thank you for all of your hard work, and thank you for also hosting this town hall meeting as well. Um, I believe that the House bill that's already under consideration is certainly a high watermark for health reform legislation, and I hope that you will vote for it once uh, you have an opportunity to look at the bill on the floor, on the House floor. As you know, Arkansas has had great success with Our Kids First, supported by Medicaid and the Child Health Insurance Program, which has cut our rate of uninsured kids in half. Will you work to ensure that health reform proposals maintain the successful CHIP program and keep those kids covered, covered with comprehensive benefits, for example, the early periodic screening, testing, and diagnostic, or uh, dental treatment, or vision and mental health? Yes. <laughs> Ashley, there was a gentleman with the hat on that was right, yeah, right there next to you. Would you? Hi, uh, my name is Justin Nichols. I'm a journeyman stagehand. Uh, my question is about taxation of benefits for the middle class. I don't think that it's appropriate for Arkansans to be have their health benefits charged uh, to pay for any reform. And would you commit today to not charging our benefits? Yeah, that that is not going to be part of. Uh, there's not going to be any tax on the middle class with regard to health care benefits as part that comes out of the Congress. And I want to Nikolai, the gentleman right there beside you, right? No, you're right. You're going, yeah, right there. No, right, right, right back there, Nick. No, no, right where you were. Back. I'm trying to be brief so we can get to as many of you as we can. And yes, sir. Um, you see Jackson here with me. He had a seizure about four months ago, back in April, I believe it was. Has an appointment tomorrow with Children's. 
It's been four months. He's on our kids. It's the only way he's getting to go to children's. I have nothing, his, but yet I end up paying for his grandparents to have Medicare. And why are the 20 to 40 somethings not being able to go, but paying for everybody else? The, the, the group of people in the country that have the highest problem with lack of insurance and underinsurance is the people between 18 and 20, or I guess it's eight, uh, 19 to 29. And, uh, you know, we were all that age one time, and we all think that we were, you know, godlike and nothing could happen to us, and of course that's, that's not true. The worst thing that we can do in solving these issues of health care is to pit one generation against another. And that's why we need a, co a comprehensive bill. I want... I don't want to do anything, you know, when, I'm, when we're talking about finding savings in the, in the Medicare budget, we're talking about doing it because it's not sustainable like it is, but we also want to do what we have done before, which is find ways to improve quality. And, 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 and of course, then we have to, the whole point is also deal with those folks that, that, that don't have health insurance or are underinsured. Eric, it's your role. There's a Clinton School student right up here at the front that has a question. Thank you, Representative Snyder. Um, I have a question. I am um, a student at the Clinton School and at the law school, and I too hope that you vote for the House bill that comes um, on, the, on the House floor. But I wanted to know what types of policies are being considered by Congress that would make health care affordable for children and families that don't qualify for CHIP but can't afford private insurance? The, 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 the basic... Um, concept of the bill is that there will be a mandate for individuals to have coverage and businesses beyond a certain size will need to provide coverage for their employees. Uh, but we recognize that both at the individual level and certain small businesses, there will need to be a subsidy to help them get that insurance. And the reason we think that's worthwhile is because we will all benefit when we have a much higher percentage of people with good health insurance, but it, it, there is a recognition that there's a substantial number of Americans that can't afford to, to go out and, and get the coverage right now. Ashley, I believe there's a woman to your right that has her hand behind you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Clogston, and I would like to say that I went on opencongress.org, and I've read in its entirety Division A of H.R. 3200. And the most concerning part that I find is, A, the creation of the Health Choices Administration as a new independent branch of the executive government, and B, the creation of the Health Benefits Advisory Committee, which will be 18 to 26 people appointed by the President or the Comptroller General of the United States. They will determine, and I'm quoting here, recommend covered benefits and essential enhanced and premium plans for all qualified health benefit plans and, quote, at least one practicing physician or other health professional will be on this committee. So I personally am concerned that 26 people are being given that much power over the creation of the exchange. I think... Where'd she go? Oh, there she is. Uh, that, that's really an important issue. That's also what I call a, a gold tablet issue. Uh, Moses did not write on gold tablets what the best way is to do that. The, the issue is, okay, when we talk about having some kind of a, a, a policy that Americans would go out and know if they buy that policy, it will not be one of those policies that doesn't cover insulin pumps, that has big gaps in coverage. But most of us don't have the skills to go out and figure out how to do that. So then the question is, okay, who's going to be the one that says, oh, what, what is a, a standard set of benefits? What, what's most common out there amongst those of us who are satisfied with our coverage? What makes the most sense for coverage? Well, the question is, who do we have make those decisions? I don't want it to be Congress. I don't think that we should have a bill that says, oh, we've decided that we, you know, want the coverage to change on this. I think that that would be the kind of micromanaging Congress doesn't need to do. I think your concerns are valid. You know, what body is it that does that? Uh, and how do they get vetted? And how do people have confidence in the decisions? I think, by the way, that's one of those issues that 
it, I think it's important you brought it up because I think it's one of those issues that, you know, I'm sure there's some congressional staffer somewhere that said, oh, how about 26? I mean, you know, that's the reality of it. You know, 50 is too many, 13 is too small. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that need to be discussed, and I don't have a good answer for you other than uh, it doesn't need to be some king. You know, we don't want to have a federal reserve of health care. Yeah, no, and the issue is, and it's a, it's a very valid concern. And then, and then once you have this body set up, we all want to have that, we want their actions to be transparent, and we want the ability to have some input into the decision-making process. And I think we will find, as time goes by, we'll figure out a way to do that that makes people comfortable. I think that is an important, an important issue. Nikolai, the gentleman in the very back, and the blue blazer back at the very back. Thank you very much, uh, Vic. Thank you for coming and meeting with your constituency. I'm a 58-year-old uh, African-American male that had a stroke on my job, and I've had a horror story since then. I'm hoping that the public option could possibly solve it. I work for a major company in the North Little Rock area, and of course, uh, I had been there two months, had a stroke. Insurance didn't start until three months. Three months passed, I joined the cafeteria plan at work, and then found that I was paying for insurance just not to get garnished if I went to the hospital or a doctor and I couldn't pay them because there was no way that I could pay the copay or uh, even you know pay the deductible over the year working the job that I had with the insurance. Since then, I've been left to work with community clinics. The uh, latest one is the Harmony Clinic, which only has two employees and didn't have enough power to do the right things because they let my stroke medicine run out. Before that, it was the College Station Clinic, where I had to wait a month to see a dentist or two weeks to see a doctor on occasion. So I'm just saying, there are people that have worked hard, voted, don't have criminal records. They deserve something too. Conservatives have to realize that all of us are American citizens. When you deny some people some things and they pay taxes, it's called tyranny. All right, Eric. You want to comment on that? You ready to move on? Okay, Eric, the gentleman right here in the middle row with glasses, he's had his hand up from the from the beginning. I like to say that I'm in favor of the public option. But, but I want the same public option to be what the House members and the Senators have. I have been, in previous jobs, uninsured. I've been in an individual plan before, and there's been times I couldn't pay for coverage or pay for the COBRA stuff from a previous employer. So to me, the public option is something that needs to be on the table, but it needs to be something that every House member and every senator and everyone in government is on or has the option to be on, because if there is a problem, if y'all are in the same boat that we are, It'll get fixed a lot quicker than if you exempt it. Let me respond. Um. Let me wrap this up. I'm getting interrupted here. Um, but I just would like to say it's important that we're all in the same boat in the public option where we can have the private insurance, but it needs to be something that's affordable that I can pay for or that I can at least have if I'm on unemployment or public assistance so that we have some way of having not universal coverage, but at least affordable coverage for everyone. The, um, the issue of the public plan option, and it's, it's an option. That is, obviously, it's very important to some people in this room. You really want it. There are other people that think that's a terrible idea, right? Some of you think it's a terrible idea to have a public public option because it's, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's perceived as being a government run. 
Let me tell you what I see the advantages and what I see the disadvantage of it. The advantages are, I think that if you had some kind of a public option out there that got the same amount of money as a private plan, it probably would lead to lower rates. The concern is, and I think it's not a completely unfounded concern of private, the private side of this, is government would have an inherent advantage, I think. I mean, that's my own view. Uh, now, a lot of people don't agree with me on that. The, 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 advantage, the advantage is this. Let's suppose years go by and more and more people start signing up for the public option. Mike Ross got some changes, by the way, that it could be offered by private insurance, I mean, by, by you know, insurance agents could sell the public options and things like that. I don't know if that would be what it turns out, but they could be. And you, time goes by. I think CBO estimated at the end of 10 years they thought there would be about 11 million people. If at some point it became clear that, wait a minute, that government-run public plan option is floundering. It's, it can't handle it. It's not doing it with the same money. Do you think the Congress is going to let the plan die? I think, that would, I think that's the part of the downside. I think that they would have this in, potentially inherent advantage. But anyway, I'm, I'm still trying to sort all that out. It is not, uh, as you saw over the weekend, the administration apparently is still trying to sort it out also. With regard to members of Congress, the, we are, I don't know why it is people think that uh, we have some kind of special congressional health plan. There is no con special congressional health plan. We're the same. We're treated as federal employees. You can go online to the federal employees with the Federal Employees Health Benefits Plan and see we have choices that we make. My staff has the same choices as I do. We, we, it's not a, each congressional office doesn't make a choice. Each individual federal employee makes a decision. I've chosen Blue Cross Blue Shield just because my wife's here and I'm in D.C. and it, I thought it made sense to have something that I knew would be good in both places. But there, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not a public plan. It's not a government-run plan. I I'm, I'm, have to deal with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Ashley, there's a lady who's had her hand up about three rows in front of you on, on the right. Right there, yeah, she's had her hand up a long time. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here and engaging with your constituents. We appreciate that. Um, as a doctor, you're well aware of the Hippocratic Oath, first to do no harm. There's no doubt that there are aspects of our health care that need improving. Uh, but why upend the entire system instead of focusing on the real problems? I don't know. It seems to me that health insurance, just like auto and home insurance, ought to be available over state lines, thus increasing the pool of the insured. It should, it should be portable. People with employer-based health care, if they have pre-existing conditions, they become virtually the indentured servant because they cannot change jobs. That needs to be changed. There could be laws to stop uh, ridiculous uh, exclusions of pre-existing conditions that really have no factor on that. The escalating cost is certainly a problem, but I'll be honest, I have a hard time taking seriously HR 3200 or any other health care reform that deals with the cost that doesn't deal with tort reform. By some estimates, that change alone could save literally billions of dollars. Doctors have to pay an inordinate amount of liability insurance. It causes them to uh, practice defensive medicine so that they, with an eye to defending themselves in court. I don't know why some of these things are tackled first and then see where we are. All right. The, um I, I agree with a lot of the things that you mentioned there. For example, the pre-existing conditions. We kind of have to walk down the road. So we're in agreement. We need to do away with the person who comes in and gets dinged because they have a pre-existing condition. But how do we deal with a person who comes in once they have their diagnosis of breast cancer and they walk in and say, okay, I now need health insurance. Well, here's how you get at it. You have to have, people have, like car insurance, we have to be mandated to have the coverage. And so, you say, okay, that makes sense. We're going to have the mandate to have the coverage because it's not fair to the insurance companies. But then we get back to the issue we had back here, which is, okay, then how does that person pay for it? Well, then you need a way of having a subsidy to help people pay for it if you're going to mandate it. And so that's how you walk down the road to having an individual mandate, an employer mandate, exempt a lot of small businesses. Uh, with regard to tort reform, there's two issues there. Number one, uh, I'm not sure that this administration given everything that people are saying about how they're trying to take over the world and take over the states, you know, tort, ref 
tort law has been state law for several hundred, 200 years of our history. Is we have let the states set, set tort law. The second thing is, I, I haven't seen the study. I don't think the studies are out there that say it saves as much money as people would think. The other issue, there's a flip side to that too. There are people who are big advocates of this bill who think that all the preventive stuff in this bill is gonna save billions of dollars. I don't agree with that either. I think that it's not gonna be so simple as to find you know, a magic solution either in tort reform or prevention that's gonna save all the money like it's, we're not gonna to have to do the hard work of figuring out how to uh, save money at the same time improve quality of care. All right. Let me say Abraham. one more thing on that, Skip. May I say okay. one more thing? Okay. I want to go back. A lot of what you say I do agree with. And, and I think there is a, um, a lot of uh, agreement. One of our Republican doctors, Dr. Fleming, I read a quote of his from several weeks ago in the New York Times in which he said he's coming around thinking that we may need to have an individual mandate. I mean, so I think there's increasingly agreement in several of the things that you mentioned I'm in agreement with you. All right. Uh, yes, right here. I'm Andy Abrams. We have technology of the 21st century, and it has enabled us to have true participatory democracy. In a true participatory democracy, the people are sovereign. In a republic, the elected leadership is sovereign, and they speak for the people. My question is, if we are, and we are today, in participatory democracy at the highest level, the blogs, the emails, we all are participating, learning together, and speaking out. When you get back to Washington, D.C., will the sovereignty of the people, what you have learned and what we have learned for ourselves, becoming experts on the proposed law, which do you think is going to happen? You will be speaking what you heard the people say, or will you all decide that you know what's best and you will act upon what you feel is okay? Well, um, Ms. Abrams is probably one of the most uh, skillful political pros in Arkansas. Um, here's the issue. Most House members have a, right around 600,000 constituents. That means 600,000 voices of the people. And I figured out some time ago, most of the time, those 600,000 voices have 600,000 different viewpoints. So what we try to do is to learn where we can and find the consensus that we can and then move ahead and, 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 and both at you know, at all our levels, we all recognize we're not going to get everything we want. I think, I think one of the, I think one of the the, the problems that happened uh, during the effort to do health care reform 15 years ago was, and I think the president would acknowledge this. I, I can't speak for President Bill Clinton at the, an event at the Clinton School, but I think they thought I think they pushed for the perfect, what they viewed as the perfect. And we're not willing to say, no, wait a minute, we just need to move this ball down the field some. I don't think that, I don't know what the final version is going to be of what we do, but I, I, I'm absolutely convinced and believe in my heart of hearts, we need to do something fairly major. I don't suspect, I, it's, it's probably not going to be, well, it won't be, the bill that passed out of Energy and Commerce Committee. We've got several bills from other committees and on the, on the Senate side. But we have got to do as much as we can together, and then what we can't all agree on, we have our little fights on the floor of the House and the Senate, and we part of that is these discussions back here, and we, we move forward the, the, the best we can. But there's a lot of voices of the people out there, and we all know in this room, don't we, they're not all in agreement. All right. Uh, Eric, this gentleman in the blue shirts had his hand up a long time, right here. Uh, thank you, Con. Thank you, Congressman Snyder. Um, I'm a law school student uh, here in Little Rock, and uh, just some interesting observations. Um, we live in a country that, like you said earlier, mandates that we all have car insurance because it's dangerous and there are bad things that can happen to people. We live in a country where public universities are able to exist side by side with private universities. We live in a country to where uh, public municipalities and utilities are able to exist side by side with the private entities. What is the point of health care reform if the government does not get involved in the market to make it more fair with the public? That, 
that, um, I mean, that's part of the debate that's going on. That's part of the debate that's going on. It's clear we've got discussions going on within the White House and the press reports over the weekend after uh, Governor Sebelius made the comments that, that she made. My own view is that what we want to preserve is choice uh, of plans. We want to preserve the ability of, the, of each of us to choose our doctor. We want to have the government standing beside the person as they negotiate with the insurance company that they're dealing with. Now, that is a, to me, is a big part of health reform. We get to some of the issues this woman over here brought up in dealing with pre-existing conditions and others. There are people like you who feel very strongly that the only way you can get it then is then to take this one additional step, which is to have a public, uh, some kind of a government-run public option. I'm not convinced that that is the only way we get health reform. And um, I mean, I'm, I think this discussion needs to continue. But if you deal with the issues of everybody's going to have insurance or everybody that you can reach that's a legal citizen and is not hiding on the run from the law or something, we're going to help those small businesses and individuals that we know, you know, that it will be worth it to us to help them with a subsidy, knowing that if they turn up at the hospital, we're going to end up paying a whole lot more for them if they're not in the system. Uh, we're going to give them as many choices as they can in helping them negotiate through the ex what's called the exchange in the bill, helping them negotiate with insurance companies. Well, they won't be negotiating with an insurance company, but they will have be able to find out here is the best rate for me, and that insurance company is going to stand beside, behind it because that's what they told the exchange they would do for, for this group of people. I think that's pretty dramatic reform, whether there is a government-run option or not. Now, I know that there are substantial numbers, primarily Democrats, that that think that it's essential. I'm not one of those people that think it is essential. Um, it's, not a, uh, it's not a deal breaker. I think it would be a terrible thing. I heard one of my colleagues this morning on one of the radio stations that, uh, well, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I mean, I think it was pre pretty much said he would not support a bill coming out of the House unless it had a public option. I think that would be the mistake of 15 years ago. I think that would be the mistake of 15 years ago if we don't get everything we want. Uh, that we're not going to do anything. I think that'd be a terrible mistake. I also think, and I and I and I mean this. I'm not trying to. This is what happens when you marry a minister. You know, you try to bring everybody together. I think some of. The, I think we have some very strong feelings on certain issues, and this is one of those. Now, if for those people who are very very apprehensive about having a public option there, if the president at some point says. It's not necessary. We're not going to do it. I think we can get everything we want or most of what we want without it. And that leaves us a substantial reassurance to a, you know, a pretty good segment of the American public. That can be a worthwhile thing, too, in the spirit of trying to bring people together on what I think is the most important issue to American families. You know, we say jobs is number one, right? Well, jobs is number one because you can buy the most important thing to you, which is the health of your family. And so the more we can come together, the better. Anyway, it's, it's still an ongoing discussion. These comments, I, I think, are very helpful. All right, Ashley, this gentleman right up on the front, right up here, if you'll walk down. Yes, sir. You've had your hand up a long time. She's coming with your microphone. You can probably hold it better than I can. Congressman, thank you for holding this. I appreciate your candor. I am one of your constituents from Little Rock in the 2nd District, so I'm very interested in what you have to say. I've been in corporate life for 38 years. I'm about to retire. I know how corporate insurance works. I've been in multinational locations, and I know that the public options in the UK, in, in uh, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, are not very good. Most people. Now, wait a minute. Ho, 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 ho. Let, let him finish, and we'll. I, I've, I've listened with my hand up, so you could do me the same courtesy. Yeah, let's, uh, let's show respect. Let's show. That, that's, that said, a lot of people in those countries have private insurance that overlay that. My point about, I appreciate your candor about not being in favor of a public option, but I think we have to recognize that the so-called thing that Obama and Pelosi say about choice for employers and employees is really not fact. Employees do not control the insurance that their company provides. I agree with that. If, agree if, with you that. if you create a public option that's low cost over a several year period, it's likely that employees will be dumped into that public option and you find yourself with a public health care system run by a federal government, with all due respect,
people do not trust. So how do you deal with the employers that don't have a choice? Thank you very much. The, um, just a, a couple uh, quick things. First of all, uh, there's been a fair number of comparisons comparing what any of the proposals are in the Senate or the House to what's going on in Canada or, or England, which are single-payer systems. And as you know, there are private insurance overlaid on that, mostly by more wealthy people. But none of us uh, in the Arkansas delegation are going to support a single-payer system. That's not what we're talking about. The president had some comment, I think, when he was a state senator, and he, you know, that that was his first choice. But he's been very clear. He recognizes that's not what's going to happen. That we have an employer-based system. So, comparisons to what's going on in England or Canada, that's not what we're talking about. I want this to be a market-based system where people choose between Blue Cross Blue Shield or mail handlers or whatever the different uh, the, the the different policies are. Um, what was the second part of your question there? This remind me. I guess the point is... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got it. I'm back on track. You remind me when you stood up. I think the president... Here's what I think. The president has been very... And, and you know, we, we all kind of get latched onto our, into our, onto our rhetoric. And the president has said, and, and means it, and I think it's technically accurate to say, if you like what you have now, you're going to get to keep it, right? But here's, here's the challenge that we have, this, which you point out. What most of us have now... It's what our employer chose. Now, I believe the president, we're, we're going to keep that. Uh, you know, for example, tomorrow, if I get an email from the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan that says, ah, eh, we had a falling out with Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's it. I mean, I don't get to choose them anymore. So what we're trying to preserve for the great majority of Americans is what you have now. And as you pointed out, for almost all of us, unless you're the owner of the small business or the decision maker at the big business, we we do participate in the plan that's chosen for us by our employer. But the president, you know, that's the decision-making process we have now. And when he says you're going to keep what you have now, I think that's accurate. I mean, that's clearly accurate. I don't want somehow this to, to uh, thwart the ability of businesses to choose the, the plans that they want. Also, I do not think that if there were a public option that there's going to be this huge push into it. I know that there's people out there that are saying that. But I mean, the only thing I've seen on that, I think, is CBO's numbers that thought at the end of 10 years there would be about 11 million participants. Now, obviously, there won't. There'll either be more or less. But that's not like this huge push in that. I, I, I'm not convinced that there will be a huge push to that. All right, Nikolai, you have a question. There's someone back there. You. Hello, I'm also a constituent, and thank you so much for your time. I have a sort of a technical question. I hope it's not too technical. One of the things I've heard that's being raised as an alternative to the public option is something called co-ops. How would those work? That is a great question, isn't it? Um, I don't know. That's an easy question. <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, there's actually several articles out today as people are tra starting to explore this. My, my guess is that what ultimately would happen, I mean, I don't have a problem with that being part of a bill. If there's a way to let folks come together and form a, a kind of a nonprofit co-op to do things together and make their own decisions about the kind of health care they get, and all, I mean, that makes some sense. My guess is that it would never be a very big market share uh, of what we're looking at as we go ahead. Now, maybe as years go by, it would. My guess is it would not be a very big market share. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know what else to say more than that. I mean, you've all read the same stuff I had, which is there are some co-ops that are working very well. There are some that have 500,000 to a million members. It's just difficult for me to think, like, if we want to do an Arkansas co-op, I mean, we'd have to have, you know, a third or half of the state to sign up. I just don't see that happening. And if you don't get big numbers, then you don't have much negotiation power. So I, I don't, my guess is they wouldn't work for a large numbers of people. On the other hand, if it's an option there and it can replicate in a way, I mean, the people in that one up in Wisconsin and Minnesota, I think, they're very satisfied with it. If that gets replicated a few more times because of this bill, that's not a bad thing. I just don't think it's the answer uh, for, uh, I don't think it answers the concerns that those of you who have or who strongly support a public option, I don't think it answers those concerns. Uh, for those of you who are fearful of the public option, I don't think you need to be fearful of these co-ops because I don't think that they would, they would ever be very big market share, at least for some years or decades to come. 
Eric, this lady up here in the, with the glasses on has had her hand up for a long, holding the cards, had her hand up for a long time. Yeah, she, no, 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 ma'am, it's, no, ma'am, it's, yeah, yeah, she's had her hand up for a long time. Thank you. I'm Karen Diner, and thank you, Congressman Snyder, for being here today and answering our questions. I am one of the uninsured because I lost my job in January. I could not afford $500 a month for COBRA, a continuation of benefits. I do not qualify for Medicaid. I do not qualify for Medicare, obviously. And <laughs> um, I still am not certain that I have heard what my options are or, or what proposals there are for anyone who doesn't have a job. I mean, I heard you say something about subsidized and you've said something about mandates to, and it, is it my, my understanding is that I am mandated to have coverage yep. and then the other, one more thing, my, what I have seen is that the estimates on what percentage reduction in the price is 10 to 20 percent estimate. Well, if I can't afford $500 and I'm unemployed, um, how can I afford 450 or 400? So okay, yeah, there's several, several topics there, but and, and Karen, you remind me if I forget some of the things you asked, but let's step back a minute. All right, for those of you who think we need to do nothing or to do baby steps, these are the voices that I hear. Most people don't like to stand up at public meetings and say, I lost my job, I can't afford this. Those are the people that we're still hearing from them all the time. We, we had a man call my office uh, a few weeks ago. I know he may be here. I don't, I don't know who he was. He called the office and talked to one of my staffers and adamantly opposed to everything that was going on in Washington. He called up a couple weeks later and talked to the same staffer and said, well, here's what happened. We've had this discussion at home. It turns out that my adult son has been getting all his health care through the emergency rooms because he can't afford insurance. He's now got huge debt. He said, I've changed my mind. Count me on board for this plan. <laughs> now, I don't, I mean, there's still a lot of reasons why people can be opposed to this, but we have to step back and reckon, I think, and recognize these are real, real people out there right here in Arkansas, 260,000 working, working Arkansans, who have no health care. Now, she doesn't count that because she's not working. So, several things ab about that. For, for, there, there will be an expansion of Medicaid. I think that will still be negotiable at what, what multiple of poverty, so that people can, at, at the income level, for people who don't have any income. But the, and then for people who are working, depending on their level, that will be the degree of subsidy. My guess is that, oh, and by the way, and then COBRA, that, that's not going to be the part of this. We want you to have a policy that sticks with you, whether you have a job or don't have a job, if you, if you want to. I mean, COBRA is one of those things that we've created to kind of fill in some gaps that, that I think doesn't, uh, is not as helpful to people who, who make what most people make in this country, in this state, as we would like to be. This happened to my wife when she, she's now on medical leave from the church, and, and we got the offer of signing up for COBRA with hers, and I just, I wish I'd saved it because we all could have enjoyed the laugh together, but I threw the thing away as soon as I read it about what the amount was. Ashley, the gentleman in the t-shirt at the back, is, at the very back, has his hand up a very long time. I want to just thank you, Mr. Snyder, for being here, because uh, I think one of the biggest things that's going on right now is that we're just all scared because we don't know what's really going on. We don't know what's really happening. One day, you know, somebody says this, and the next day somebody says that. My biggest concern is with the public option. I feel that whatever happens, it has to be something that can regulate the insurance companies, drug companies. <laughs> because without that, you know, and, and I think that's what the public option would do. It would create a better competition where you can actually choose what you want, you know, based on what you can do. Because right now, the insurance companies are just, just running wild. And my, my next question 
is that will you, I know you keep saying you don't know if the public option is going to be there, or you don't know uh, how you're going to vote on it, but you're here listening to us, listening to our concerns and our fears, and by what, by what you are hearing, is a public option something that you are for, that you will vote for, it, if it's there? And the last no. thing, the last thing, sir, and I'll let you go. Uh, I know everybody is, talks about uh, the government being involved in health care, being involved in, in this situation, but to me, isn't Medicaid, Medicare a government-run operation? Let's see, I need to start making notes of questions. Um, with regard to the public option, um, I don't know how to explain it or say it any differently. It's, it's not a deal breaker for me at this point. If in order to get a bill signed into law, it has a public option that is paid for, that no one is mandated to be in, in it, I don't want anyone to be forced from what they have now, or if they don't have health insurance, to be forced into a a public option. I think everyone needs to have a choice in the private sector. If that's what it takes to get a bill signed into law, then I would support it. My, my guess is, yeah, but there's the other side. My, my, my guess is that it will be the other way, that in order to get a bill signed into law that moves the ball down the field, that it will be a bill that does not have a public option. That's just a guess, and I would support that too. Uh, so. I, now, I, I, if everybody in this room will agree one way or the other, then that will solve my challenge. But I don't see that happening, so we're going to continue to have these discussions about it. A another key factor, Mike Ross has been a big proponent of this, and I give him a lot of credit for this, is that he has to make sure that the, that the public option um, is, is paid for. I mean, it's, it has the same uh, amount of money that they don't have an unfair advantage. I mean, that's, that's part of the, the fairness of it. See, if there's anything else that you said that I want to respond to. Medicaid, Medicare. Well, I mean, he just, I mean, they are government-run systems. Most people in Medicare are, 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 are satisfied with Medicare. Uh, the, I'd say two things about it. Former Majority Leader Dick Armey over the weekend referred to, you know, Medicare as being tyranny. And I, and I, I like Dick Armey. I, I, I used to talk to him sometimes, but I just think, come on now. You know, that has been a huge lifesaver for several generations of Americans. And it's not a perfect system. We got work to do on it. We got to figure out how to pay for it. But to somehow say it is tyranny, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's all I'll say. But, but, but remember, Medicare is on the same not good trajectory as every, about every other health player plan that we have in the country right now. We've got the work to get that thing going the other way. All right, we have, uh, her hand's been up a long time. Clinton School alumnus Lindsey Clark is back there. And since this is a Clinton School event, Lindsay's going to ask a question. Thank you, Skip. Thank you, Representative Snyder. Um, we've talked about pre-existing pre conditions, and I know the majority of people are in favor of getting rid of that exclusion. But I want to challenge those lawmakers to think, how do we go beyond that? And, and how do we really ensure choice? I've had type 1 diabetes for the last 21 years and been pretty fortunate to have health insurance coverage, but it took for me so many years to fight to get control of my diabetes, only to learn that I really don't have control of it in our current health system. I'm tired of facing job discrimination. I'm tired of facing job lock. Tired of facing geographic um, discrimination where I can live because I have a pre-existing condition and I'm being punished for it. So how are we gonna ensure that the Americans who have a pre-existing condition or other conditions will get the care that they need regardless of where they live, regardless of what job that they have. No, that's, um, if, if, if we follow the basic, you know, proposals that are on both the Senate and House side, you're the kind of person we're trying to reach. I have, I've seen, seen this before. It's probably worse than family businesses where, you know, there's two or three kids and a mom and dad, and they're all working together and one of them has a health issue and it's like, my baby can never leave home. I mean, I have seen that, where people, they need to move on down the road, but they can't because they have a health care issue, and so they stay at the same business, uh, hoping that it doesn't end because they get in the problem. I, I'll just repeat what I said. The basic formulation is, in order to deal with it, we need to do away with that. We're, you know, we're, I think most of us are in agreement with that, or substantial numbers here are in agreement on that. 
But then that leads to the next point. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you have to do it by having that everyone be mandated so they're in the system from the very beginning. And, and, and then that, that uh, additional cost of those who, I mean, I have had heart surgery, so people probably consider me have pre-existing. Uh, the additional expense of us is shared by everyone and because we're in the system uh, from the beginning. And then the portability comes because there isn't any pre-existing commission, so you can change uh, pre -pre -pre pre-existing condition exemption, so then you can change jobs, and everybody knows that's what the rules are going to be. Uh, it will be, we hadn't talked about that, but there is an incredible economic inefficiency of people not being able to change jobs because of fearfulness about, about uh, their health insurance. Incredible inefficiency. And so, so for those who say, yeah, I really like what I have right now and don't want to change, but there's also that segment that says, yeah, I like what I have right now, but I just as soon change someplace else and like what they have too because I want to change jobs, but I can't now. That is a, an underlying issue as part, part of us, uh, as far as us being more efficient and competitive on the world economy. All right, let's see. That was Lindsay's question. Eric, the lady, there's a lady right to your right. Are you, you're, yeah, right there. You're. Thank you for taking my question. Arkansas is the largest state per capita that doesn't have a dental school. Four counties don't even have a dentist. As an Arkansas native, I'm acutely aware of this when I look around, and I was just wondering what has been, not necessarily here, however, I was, <laughs> I was just wondering what has been mentioned to take care of this problem, the dental issue. Didn't she have great teeth? She had great teeth, that's it. Well, that, that, that is not, uh, and uh, you know, the federal government's not going to tell Arkansas whether they should have a dental school or not. But, you know, I can say this as a family doctor, uh, what we decided some years ago in the way we deliver health care is that the teeth are not part of the human body and, and, and that your, 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 your uh, mental health is not part of the human body. And, um, and we've even gone so far as to say we don't really think, you know, autism is part of the human body, we're going to treat it differently, and we've got to get, get past those things. But I, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer with regard to Arkansas and a dental school. I, I will say this, say this um, and I, I really actually don't know if you have great teeth because my eyes aren't good enough, but it, it, to me dental care is not about does somebody have a great smile. I mean, I have seen too many occasions when bad uh, oral hygiene and dental care and all that really contributes to bad health outcomes and we all know that and so it's something we as a state uh, need to work on and I'll, I'll pass your concerns on to Governor Beebe. How about that? Ashley, there's a gentleman up again at the door by the exit sign. If we could ask him to come out to the front. Yes, sir, you by the exit sign right there. Congressman, thank you very much for being here. If the issue is health care insurance reform, why is it that we expect the insurance industry, which controls the rate of costs and the amount of money that goes into the system, to reform itself without a bigger market player like we the people, the public? Well, reference, it, <clears throat> reference has been made to the, um, you know, we've talked before about members of Congress and the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan. I mean, I think that's probably the best example, which is as federal employees, you go online and you, you make a decision as a new federal employee, and you can change once a year, or you can change if you've had a change in your family, like the birth of three babies at the same time. You can change if you want to. Uh, but you go and you look at the plans and you look what the premiums are. You know, we have, you know there's a, a employee share and the, and the government share. And you, you, they have to compete. And, if, and, I, and I think that competition, I mean, it's worked in other aspects of American life. I think it can work here. Now, here's where, where that falls apart some. In states like Arkansas, we have areas geographically and there's areas of the country that the person says, I want health insurance, and there's not like... 10 or 20 choices in those rural areas. So, that, I mean, that's, that's the other side of it. But my own view is I think that the, if we set the, make some of these regulatory changes and statutory changes we need to make with regard to pre-existing conditions and those, some of these other issues, uh, no rescissions, all those kind of stuff, 
I think that I, I think the marketplace will work better. I mean, insurance companies uh, have to, they put a lot of energy into doing some of the things that they find distasteful, but because of the way it's set up right now, they feel like they have to. Now, I think that if we do some of the things we want to do, that uh, as a as a people, that they will I, th I think will do more in line with what we all want to do, and I think I think they'll probably sleep better at night too. But I I'm not. I can't predict. I just think that that's. I don't think that there's anything necessarily magic about having a public uh, public option that would have the same funding as as the uh, the private options. Gentleman in the white coat, right here. Yes, sir. You've been had your hand up a long time. Wait, if you'll uh, wait for the mic, please. Thank you, Congressman Snyder. Uh, my wife and I. Thank goodness she works for the federal government, and we have a uh, federal uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And uh, our co-pays have gone up 33% this year. I had a respiratory infection that lasted about six months. And just the out-of-pocket expenses, not including medication, has come to over $2,000. We pay about oh, between five and $600 a month just for the insurance itself. So the problem in, in my uh, mind, it, it's, it's insurance is the problem. Health care is what we're talking about. And we have, she has a good job. I started a small business last year, and I can't afford employees and, and afford to pay them their health insurance. Um, it's, just, it's just gotten out of hand with the, with the insurance. And we need to rein in the insurance companies. And I, I think that the... I think that the public option is a good one. If you can allow choice, I'm going to choose the public option. And there's a lot of people that would do that. I, I appreciate your comment. Skip, may I call on someone? Yes. When you and I drove over here, we were riding, there was a van next to us that with several colors of paint that said, stop this, what, what, what did it say? Government option. Stop, stop the health care plan. If that person's here, anybody who would paint their van across the windows deserves to get to ask a question if they want. <laughs> I don't know where that person is. Anyway, well, we saw the message on the van, if that's helpful. Go ahead. All right. Uh, let's see. We, we had, where was that question from? That was here. It's Eric's. Uh, okay, Eric, we have a Clinton School student on the front row. Thank you, Congressman Snyder, for being here today. I, um, before my grandmother died two years ago, um, she was on Medicare, so she didn't have to pay for any kind of procedures that she had or the pharmaceutical drugs that she needed. But we had problems with doctors giving her unnecessary tests and a lot of unnecessary drugs. And she actually at one point got very sick because she was on several different drugs from several different doctors, many of which she didn't need. So my question is, um, is Congress going to do anything about Medicare and Medicaid reform, and if so, um, what are they planning to do? No, that, that, that problem is one of the challenges we have in health care, and, and, and I'll tell you what, the doctors don't like that either. I mean, I have been in that situation before where I give a prescription to a, a, a patient, and I think I'm doing the right thing, and then like three days later, a family member comes in and says, let me show you what's in the medicine cabinet, and it's perhaps not the identical drug, but a drug from different, you know, the same class, and people are getting double-dosed. And uh, Let me say s several things. Number one, uh, having a good primary care system is essential. Essential. I don't want to use the word gatekeeper, but we need to have somebody that's responsible for sorting out all the different uh, referrals and specialties. The second thing is, and, and particularly in Arkansas, we are so, there's so much more we can do on health information technology. Uh, if we have, a, the VA is probably the leader in this in the country right now, they pick up a lot of drug errors and, and prevent drug errors uh, because of the, the health information technology system that they, that they have. Um, in the stimulus bill that was passed, one of the things that didn't get a lot of attention was uh, there's a substantial amount of money to help uh, areas of the country that don't have health, have health information technology you know, put in the systems and get the training they need. Now, it doesn't, it's not 100% pay for it all, but there are a fair number of hospitals in Arkansas that are looking at that dollars as a source, a source of funds. But 
But so you, you think about you think about that. That was that's all good faith stuff. Everybody's writing those prescriptions out in the spirit of trying to help your grandmother, and yet what we're doing right now isn't working the way we want to. And so that's an example. That's not. There's no fraud. There's no abuse. It's just it's just a, a waste of of the money for the drugs. But more importantly, it really decreases the quality of, of a person's life when that happens. And those are the kinds of things that technology will help us if we make the investments in it. Actually, there's a lady on the front row over here that's been waving at me from the last 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for being here, Congressman, and thank your family for allowing it. Um, I want to go on record that I am for health reform and I'm for public option. But I want to state why. Um, I was walking for Obama in Malden, Missouri, and I was talking to this family, and I went to this town, and they had lost all their key jobs, so now the town looked like a ghost town. And um, the kids were out playing. There was about 10 kids outside. There was a five-year-old little girl. And the dad and the mom, they were talking to me. And one of the things they, he said was, my daughter had appendicitis. I didn't have the money. I sat on it. And she almost died. I, mean, I know that our government now has more money for kids. But it takes the parent to take the child, to do the paperwork, to take the child to get there. Also, we have a lot of people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. We're to serve, and we need to be able to take care of them. With some kind of public option, they won't have to go through tons and mounds of paperwork, which tends to hold us back. Um, they'll be able to have their health care. And even in Arkansas, we had Target Distribution Center close. We lost over 500 jobs. Although we have brought more jobs in, we still have people who have lost jobs. How are they getting help? How are they getting their health care then? And then um, I would like to say with all of that, how are we going to take care of the physicians who's going to do all the work? I, I, I think the story that you tell about the, the the person that had the appendicitis that gets delayed. That's that's what the studies show, that people that don't have health insurance, they they wait longer thinking it'll go away. They wait longer and then they regret it. I mean, I, I can't imagine the, the parental guilt that goes into trying to make a decision about whether you go to the emergency room and find out it's just a cold or oh, he's got a bellyache, send him home. And then, and then the one time you decide not to take him is the time they have something bad. But th that's one of the reasons th th those poignant but all too often stories that happen in our country now and and shouldn't. I don't know if I have I don't know if I have anything to respond to other than, than I, pre, I appreciate your view about about the public option. I, I, with regard to the paperwork from the private insurance companies, I you know, we just went through on December 9th three babies being born, several week hospitalizations for each of the babies, my wife having to go back in the hospital in the coronary care unit and for a while it just seemed like there was a flood of paperwork and we get, I, I get confused pretty rapidly we're busy enough but but I, I you know I can only be I'm just one person here I did not feel like I was overwhelmed with with paperwork I would call up sometimes and say this can't be right and they'd call back and a day later and say no that wasn't right we forgot to submit it to your insurance so you know whether it's a private system or a government system they both can do good things as far as efficiency and they can both make mistakes um, but I, I don't know. I think we all need to learn from each other. Uh, Nikolai, the gentleman in the blue shirt right here, sir. You've had, yes, sir. You've had your hand up a long time. It looks blue still from here. It may not be blue. It looks blue from here. Hope everybody has health care for your sore shoulder. <laughs> um, I'm in favor of this health care reform. I think people who need health care insurance that cannot afford it need to have it. Um, our, our American public spends somewhere around 17% of gross domestic product on health care. Uh, other industrialized democracies spend somewhere less than 10%. Somehow or other, I don't think that's very economical or very efficient. I think we can find that $100 billion a year you were talking about to pay for the $1 trillion over 10 years and the health care cost controls. Um, I guess I'm a little bit 
leery about the public option like so many other people are. I think my greatest fear is shoving everybody over to that side. I'd like to see an alternative, if nothing else, some kind of insurance pool uh, that the government pays for for these health care providers to provide packages at a certain bid price or something that we may subsidize there. Finally, I'd like to ask everybody to please get information yourself, learn from yourself, not what you hear out there. It sounds like buzzwords. Using, using catchphrases like death panel is abominable. Use your own intellect, use your own research. Talk to people who you know that don't have health insurance to get their personal experiences. And when you respond to these, quit being so nice and saying, I just don't think that's true. Many of these are lies for political purposes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 1.30. Our students have to go back to class. Many of you have to go back to work. And I have to go back to work. Thank you all for being here. Let's give a Thank you all very much. Appreciate you.